So let us start with uh, the sh uh, Shanti Mantra. Om Bhadram Karne Vishnuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Stirai Rangai Stushtuvagam Sastanu Bhihi Vyashe Madeva Hitain Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridhashravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Star Kshu Arishtanemihi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 so we are in the third chapter of the Mandukya Karika and the third chapter aims to demonstrate the non-duality that, that there is one non-dual reality, one without a second uh, with, tries to demonstrate it with reason based on experience and you are that non-dual reality so Gaudapada has come to this position where uh, he reduces the entire teaching to what he calls no mind, Amani Bhava Basically, we saw no mind does not mean not thinking, becoming mindless or brainless or something like that, not falling asleep, not going into a coma or something like that, or not even remaining all the time in samadhi. No. No mind basically means spiritualization of the mind. So the mind which is the source of samsara and trouble no longer becomes the source of samsara and trouble. In fact, it is, as the Bhagavad Gita says, the mind itself is your best friend, the mind itself is your greatest enemy. So how to make this mind, which is our greatest enemy, into our best friend? That's another way of putting it. No mind. Mind becomes no mind. And we saw also Gaudapada says, how is, it, how is this accomplished? It's accomplished through Atma Satyanu Bodhena. By an awakening, a realization of the real nature of the self. Who am I or what am I? And in the Mandukya format, this what am I is... Our entire experience, the waker and the waker's world, what we, what we see right now, what we are experiencing right now. When you fall asleep, the dreamer and the dream world and the deep sleeper and the deep sleep potential, the darkness. Uh, in, in Sanskrit, the uh, Vishwa in, in the Jagrat, the waker in the waking world, the Taijasa in the Swapna and the Pragya in the Sushupti. This is what we normally think of ourselves. That's our experience of life. And what the Mandukya has shown is, no, you are actually not the waker. You are actually not the dreamer. You are actually not the deep sleeper. You are the one consciousness, uh, in the, uh, which is the background of all of these three. You are not defined by the waker, the person here. Nor as, you, as in fact you are not limited by your experience in the dream. When you wake up from the dream, you realize, I was not that. I was not that. I'm free of that. So, I am the Turiya, the fourth, the pure consciousness, beyond the waker, the dreamer, and the deep sleeper. And yet, this fourth, this pure consciousness, is also the underlying reality of the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. You, the fourth alone, that pure consciousness, the Turiya, you alone appear as the waker in the waker's world, much as you, the waker right now, you realize that I alone was in the dream, everything in the dream, indeed, I was that. My mind became all of that. And the person in the dream who was experiencing all that, I alone was that. Do you see that experience? Do, are you with me? If you understand the relationship between waking and dreaming, if you understand the relationship between waking and dreaming, you will understand the relationship between waking and enlightenment. Waking from waking. <laughs> yeah. What happens when you wake up from a dream? You suddenly realize, first of all, oh, that was a dream. This is real. Not only that, you realize that everything in the dream, in the dream, what, what did it look like? I am there and a lot of other things besides me is going on, just like a waking experience. You didn't know you were dreaming. You felt it was like a waking experience. And every waking experience is basically subject and object. You are there and a lot of other people are there and things are going on in the world. 
and that world seems different from you, those people seem different from you, right? So that's what your experience was like. And yet when you wake up, what is the realization? Oh, that was a dream. And immediately comes, easily, automatically comes the realization, everything in that dream, I alone was. Which is a big difference from what it felt like in the dream. In the dream it felt, I am there and everything else is there. But now when you wake up, you feel everything in the dream, I alone was all of that. I means my mind alone became all of that. And I who was in the dream, that too I was. And all of that was not real. It's my waking mind which became all of that. Exactly like that, upon waking up, upon enlightenment, what happens is, not that you snap up, the difference is this, because the dream is an example. The difference is this, not that you'll suddenly wake up in a different world altogether. Like it happens in waking and dreaming, you'd wake up in a different world, you are now sitting in your bed. You, you thought you were in Mumbai, you had, here you are in Manhattan. You thought you were in a shopping mall, now here you are in, sitting up in your bedroom. It's a different world altogether, which happens in your waking, dreaming and waking. But upon enlightenment, you don't wake up into a new world. You wake up into your real nature, which is appearing as this world. You still see the same thing. There's a big difference between wake, this dream example and enlightenment. Your eyes will still see things. Ears will still hear sound. The senses will function. The mind will function. The world as it is, it will appear. But now you're suddenly aware of awareness itself, of a... Of a very deep dimension of existence in which all of this is appearing. So to that extent it's like dreaming, but to a certain extent it's not like dreaming also. So this difference must be understood. That's why teacher is necessary. Once you think, when once uh, you hear things like, oh it's like waking up from a dream, you feel that, oh when you become enlightened, you realize that all this will disappear and some kind of, some Brahman will appear, some burst of light or something like that. No, no. Same world, but again not same, profoundly different. So I am that one, that, that one without a second, that consciousness, Brahman, Turiyam, whatever you call it, which is appearing as this entire world experience. You realize that. This is called Atma Satyanubodha. Once you have that, that mind becomes no mind. The mind is no longer an obstacle. Imagine your mind in the dream state. All the terrors and, and the anxieties it gave r rise to. Once you wake up from that, none of that affects you anymore. You can laugh it off. Okay, it was a bad dream. Well, you can laugh it off. Exactly in the same way, once you snap out of this, right here, this, this world of terrors and temptations, of fascination and fear, it no longer affects you. You rise above it or you, you, you are aware of a transcendent dimension to you. You are no longer trapped in this. All right. If only it happens. But it doesn't. It's not that easy. That's what Gaudapada is coming to now. That awakening to that doesn't seem to happen all that easily. So now the next few verses are on Vedantic meditation. So this Vedantic meditation, why? Why this Vedantic meditation? After all, I have read it all. I have studied it. I have understood it. Now what remains? Come. Yes, you have to stay with it. Why do you have to stay with it? If you wake up from your dream into the waking, nobody says you have to practice a lot of waking meditation to, uh, to stay away from the dream. No, it happens. It's automatically you're awake and you're safe from the dream. Why doesn't it happen like that? So here we have to go back to the very beginning of Vedanta. Remember, when you start Vedanta, you are told about the fourfold qualification. Now, at the end of our, or towards the end of our study, we suddenly realize the overwhelming importance of those fourfold qualifications. Why Vedanta works? Why doesn't it work? The fourfold qualification, do you remember? Hopefully, <laughs> this is the thing to remember. Now, if you don't remember, now it's the time to remember. <laughs> Viveka, the discernment between the eternal and the non-eternal, between the ultimate reality and what is appear reality and appearance. Then uh, vairagya, what is vairagya? A renunciation, a dispassion for the non-eternal, for the changing temporal order of things. Um, th that is vairagya. Then the sixfold treasure, shama, 
Dhamma, we'll come to that later. Just I'm enumerating. Shama, control of the mind. Dhamma, control of the senses. Uh, uparati, withdrawal from uh, worldly, uh, sensuous enjo enjoyment. Samadhana, the mind which has been withdrawn now must be focused on Vedanta, on this knowledge. Then Titiksha, a spiritual fortitude. No matter what comes, I will stick to it. I am searching for enlightenment. Uh -huh. Then Shraddha, a deep faith that what is given here is true. I might not understand it right now, but let me pursue it until I realize it. So th to that extent, a working faith. And then the Mumukshutvam, an intense desire to be free of the travails of life, uh, uh, free of suffering. So these are the fourfold qualification now. Now suddenly it will become relevant again. Um, we will see how, why it is so tremendously important. It is those whose minds already have these fourfold qualifications. Uh, for them, Vedanta works directly. Those who do not have it sufficiently, for them Vedanta does not seem to work. Now, when it works directly, Vedanta works and gives its results. What will happen to such people, the people we call enlightened, they'll have twofold result. One is called the two results of jnana, enlightenment. What are the results of enlightenment? The primary result is moksha, freedom. They will be free of suffering, they will not be reborn again. The, the cycle of birth and death, which is the basic paradigm in which not only Hindus, but Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, in Indian philosophies tend to look at life. You are free of that limitation. You are free, you are released into your infinite nature. So that's the freedom, the spiritual freedom, that's the goal of all of these philosophies. Free of suffering, dukkha nivritti, an attainment of true lasting peace, atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda praptishya, an attainment of ultimate peace or, or joy. That's result one. See, that's great, what else is required? Well, one more thing is required. As long as you are still alive in this particular body, even after enlightenment, the saints, the enlightened people, they, luckily for us, they continue to live for some time. So, in that bodily life also, you, the pure consciousness, you still are like everybody else present in this world. And the enlightened person manifests glorious qualities, extraordinary qualities. Serenity and peace and love and unselfishness, um, self-control, all naturally come to the, this person. A, a, a great purity, a great concern for the welfare of others, um, which are basically the qualities we see in the great spiritual teachers of humanity. So these manifest automatically. So this is when things go as planned. As, uh, what is, what is it called? Uh, textbook approach. So you have got the fourfold qualifications and it manifests and good. But, alas, not all of it works. Most of us will complain, no, it is not, I am unfortunately nowhere near that. Whether I will get the final liberation after death, never come back again, I don't know. I don't even know whether I had past lives, whether I had future lives. So that's entirely theoretical. And having the qualities of a saint right now, I must be honest, I don't have them. So Vedanta is not working. Uh, it, it's not delivering what it promised. So what's gone wrong? The, the, uh, the lacuna, the, the missing link is the lack of the fourfold qualifications. It's not sufficient. And so what one must do now is practice. Even after you have studied this most highest teaching, if you find the results are not evident in your day-to-day -day life, uh, let me give you the name, it's called Jivan Mukti. That's the second result of enlightenment. First result, Moksha. Or more technically, Videha Mukti. Uh, liberation after death. You will never be born into a limited form, form again. Never come back to samsara again. You exist as the infinite Brahman. All right. But also secondarily, the result should be vide, uh, Jivan Mukti. While you are in this body also, you are free. You are an enlightened being. That result also should be there. Now, for those it, it does not work, the terms are Mandadikari, Madhyamadikari. The 
one with minimal qualifications and one with uh, with imperfect qualifications the middle middle uh, seeker middle ground seeker and the lowest ground seeker none of us here are without qualifications we are by, by the very fact that you are here at, at four o'clock on, on a Wednesday afternoon to listen to an arcane ancient philosophy shows an intense spiritual desire so it's there we have it we are spiritual seekers all of us you may not think of yourself in that light that oh I'm a spiritual seeker to some extent you must be otherwise why would you be here especially those who have been coming again and again and again studying and pursuing it for years together we are spiritual seekers so we have those qualifications but not enough not enough and those have to be developed so there is something called Uttama Dikari the most excellent spiritual seeker those who have those qualifications there is the Madhyam Adhikari, the middle ground spirit, spiritual seeker with whom we would consider a wonderful person but not good enough apparently and then there they are the, the lower ground the um, Manda, Manda literally means slow <laughs> the, uh, the seeker who is a seeker but also uh, has many issues so those have to be worked out now, among these two, both of whom have problems, there are two kinds of problems which will come. There is the, the, the Manda Dikari, the lowest category of, of seekers, who are, still, who are still definitely spiritual seekers, who have the spiritual aspiration. But, due to impurity of mind, due to lack of these qualifications, what happens is, this teaching does not take hold. So the complaint will be, I don't get it. It sounds fascinating, but it's not very clear. And a variety of misunderstandings or no understanding. Some of our Swami, I remember one Swami who used to teach us when we were novices. Um, he was like, we used, to say, we used to say all round, you know, <laughs> he was fat, <laughs> like a fat Buddha. Very fair and all round. And he had this huge head, which would go red, his face would go red. And he would glare at us and in a high pitched voice, he would say, Hmm, no understanding, a little understanding, or a misunderstanding. <laughs> so that is the problem with the, the, uh, the first group of seekers who, whose qualifications are not good enough, the lowest category. Um, so it does not make much of an impact. Maybe you're interested, but it's not very clear. Uh, or mistakes, many mistakes. Just talking with such a pe person will show, throw up a lot of issues and questions and problems. So what does this person do, this lowest category of, 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 or the, the primary category of seekers? So for them, what is recommended is, you go on with your Vedantic pursuit, you go on studying, but the emphasis should be on spiritual practices like Upasana and Karma. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga. Karma Yoga, unselfish action dedicated to God to purify the mind. Bhakti Yoga, a devotional practice devotional devotion to what to saguna brahman brahman in the form of you know the, the, the what you can call the god of religion which is none other than the absolute but in a, with a particular uh, name and form so bhakti yoga and raja yoga meditation concentration focus focus so these practices over a long period of time makes the mind um, ready what, what will these practices do? They will generate the fourfold qualifications. Viveka, Vairagya, the six treasures, an intense desire to be free, they will generate. An intense desire for enlightenment. No, Swami, not much. I, I mean, I would like to be enlightened, but not all that much. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, that must come. That must come. Eventually, it will come to everybody. And when it comes, you know that enlightenment is very close. To generate that, these practices are necessary. So, f uh, these practices must go hand in hand with Vedantic study. In fact, Vedantic study is secondary in these cases. We must continue, keep coming to the class, but definitely do not neglect your spiritual practices. There is another category of um, uh, seekers, the middle ground. What is their difference from the first ground, for, for the first group? Their difference is, this group of people will say, I get it. They really feel 
They have got what Vedanta teaches. It's very clear to them. They understand the teachings. They are fascinated by it. And it seems true to them. It seems true. Uh, it's, it's, they, have got, they have got clarity. They have got conviction. And yet one problem remains. The problem remains. They will say, I get it. But you are saying that I will find deep and lasting joy. And I'll be, I will be able to overcome all sorrows. But that's not really happening. It still feels intellectual. It still feels like I have understood something and it's a fantastic thing which I have understood. But um, the results are not evident in my life. Am I able to overcome say an insult or an illness? Overcome in what sense? Remember, spiritually overcoming suffering. Here is a little note, footnote. In what sense? I have a toothache. If I am spiritual enough, will my toothache go away? I'm I'm in trouble with the what happened? Oh, this one here. I'm in trouble with the IRS. So, if I'm spiritual enough, will the IRS go, IRS go away? No. No. Then, in what sense, um, overcoming suffering? In what sense? The professor who was here, Professor Indam Chakravarti, in his I heard his talk in um, Stony Brook, where he quoted something from the Buddha. Very interesting thing he quoted from the Buddha. He said. In one of the original Pali texts, the Buddha says, Dukkha, so the Buddhism is very big on Dukkha. Dukkha means suffering. From physical suffering to mental suffering to existential suffering, even if all other things have been taken care of, even just existential angst, you know. So Dukkha, what is the nature of suffering? And the Buddha says, suffering is like a man who is hit by an arrow, Imagine how it stings and hurts and immediately he's hit by a second arrow. So imagine how much it hurts, the suffering. Now, the first arrow is what is hap- actually happening in the world. Maybe a sickness, maybe some kind of problem, an accident, maybe somebody behaves badly. The actual event in the world, it could be in the world, it could be in the body, something there. And the second arrow is the internal suffering. The reaction within. Oh, it's so awful. Oh, it's so horrible. I'm, I'm, I'm undone. I'm, I'm in terrible pain. What? Yes. Um, so, this is the second arrow. Now, most of our suffering is because of the second arrow. It's a reaction. You may not think so. Isn't it more awful what is happening in the world rather than what we think about it? I get an illness and then what I think about it, that's secondary. The illness is the most important thing. No, no, not really. Just yesterday we were reading the description of Sri Ramakrishna who has got cancer of the throat at that time, terminal cancer. And the description is again and again how joyfully he is walking around and talking to people. This is beaming with joy. How is it possible? The disease is there, it's real, it's painful, it's awful. And yet he continuously manages to transcend it. How? So it's the second arrow which is more important. The real suffering. I I mentioned it other times. I attended a medical conference where a doctor, it was on pain management. And a doctor said, 80% of our suffering is, um, is not physical. It's how we react to the physical suffering. It was, a doctor, uh, it was a session on chronic pain, managing chronic pain. So he said 80% of it. And he went on to say, unfortunately, our uh, analgesics, our painkillers, they deal only with the 20% physical pain. And that too, he says, half the time, they don't work. But 100% of the time, they have side effects. <laughs> uh, but 80% of the pain is psychological. Our reactions, we don't think so, but it it is like that. It's that second arrow. So the Buddha says, what spirituality can do for you? Yes. Yes, Maharaj, the Kuang Duk example who self-immolated himself in Vietnam, the monk. Yes. He was burning himself. No no journalist, no one saw any any problem in himself. He was just sitting there meditating. There are many such examples. The, The great spiritual teachers... They all died when they died. The body died. 
and so many of them had diseases and that as just like everybody else it's a great demonstration of the power of spirituality that you can actually transcend suffering it is there and yet it's as if not there so it's really something in incredible so the buddha says i can remove buddhism in general spirituality can remove the suffering caused by the second arrow which is most of the suffering which is the real suffering so you transcend that what it means is the external problems will go on they are produced by our karma and they will go on as long as we have got karma they will be produced good and bad will keep coming but it enables you to transcend them and that's actually an accurate description when you look at the lives of the saints of those you consider to be enlightened very spiritual people throughout history did they not suffer did they not you seem doubtful anybody look at the lives of they all suffered and all kinds of sufferings and sometimes much more than other people it seemed so they had those things then you might say then what do you mean vedanta promises spirituality will take you beyond suffering when sri ramakrishna had both cancer of the throat swami vivekananda had number of diseases he died at the age of 39 so how do you say that vedanta takes away suffering so it, what is what is meant by spirituality taking away suffering is not that one physical world has its own rules its own causality and that will go on okay so this is an important footnote to keep in mind but even that doesn't seem to happen when the qualifications are not there so this second category says that i have understood vedanta it's very clear to me i am convinced by me i'm sold and i'm convinced by it but it's not giving the advertised results the second arrow still stings a little bit at least it's still there uh, it it creates suffering in inside me H how it's not yet a living reality for me now why i'm saying all this now it, it brings us to the topic of which is which has started now i'll come to you so what is necessary for the second group if you are convinced by it if you are um, uh, it's clear to you but it must become a living reality for you now Remember the first group nothing is required they are already enlightened they don't need any of this second group needs an intense dose of a special kind of practice which he is going to mention which is basically vedantic meditation so what he is going to talk about till the end of this chapter now is a special kind of practice which is useful basically it consists of staying with the teaching you have understood it yes is it clear to you yes is it are you convinced yes now stay with it i'll come to both of you but remember for whom will it not work uh, have you understood it no not quite then then this practice is not for you is it clear to you is it are you convinced about it no 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 not quite then this practice is not for you then what is what is for, uh, recommended for you the earlier one continue your vedantic study meditate bhakti yoga karma yoga all of those things for what for generating the fourfold qualifications which will bring you to this stage yeah all right quickly um, just if i was to correctly two uh, lessons ago uh, you said that even if you don't achieve enlightenment in this life but if you manage to have a breakthrough and you manage to sustain it yeah it will lead to liberation yes correct so you still have to live your life you're not enlightened but at the moment of death you're liberated yes for good yes you are good that was a pretty good observation in fact this second group whom we are going to talk about now even in this second group there is a range and those who are at the top of the range are exactly what you what you mentioned now they have already had a breakthrough for them it's clear they are no, what is the nature what how how do you know it's clear or not are you still a seeker or have you found it if you are clear that you have found it now your only problem is to stay with it is to pervade your life with it if you still feel no it's still theoretical for me it's still i've got to do certain things or get certain experiences then i'm still a seeker but now you know what we are talking about now it's very clear to you if that is your breakthrough then you are in that second stage definitely and you will benefit in enormously by this practice which is going to be uh, recommended now holy mother ma sharada she put it in a very simple way <coughs> She, um, to somebody whom she initiated she is giving initiation means that person is free ultimately after this but no more uh, 
I mean, she's, uh, that person is free from the cycle of birth and death. So this person asked her, I have been initiated, given a mantra by you. Do I need to do any more spiritual practice? And she immediately understood what he was asking. Uh, I, I guess it was a he. And she said to him that, my child, it is done for you. You will be liberated at the time of your death. But if you want to taste the joy of spiritual liberation, here, he, she simply said, if you want to taste the joy, then you must practice here. So this is what is discussed uh, in, by Gaurapada or in most detail it's discussed by Vidyaranya Swami in his book Jivan Mukti Viveka. It's a dissertation on enlightenment while living. For such people, freedom after death is guaranteed. Those are the best top one percentile of that second category. First category, it's already done. But that category, freedom after death is guaranteed. But right now, uh, if you would like to get the full benefit of a day right now, starting now, then this is what you need to do. And it also makes sense if you look at the lives of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Notice how even after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, these monks, they all had extraordinary spiritual experiences during the lifetime of Sri Ramakrishna. And how much practice they did afterwards. Why? Every time they were asked, Swami Shivananda was asked, why do you do all this? You have already got these. Swami Brahmananda was asked, and they replied the same rep reply. What he gave us, we are trying to make it our own. Becoming established in it. Alright, quickly, I'll come to you. Quickly, what if the breaks were only lasted 5, 10 minutes or 30 minutes max and then it goes to the <laughs> Does that count? Then it's not a breakthrough. No. No, it's, a, it's not, a, not um, uh, valueless. It is valuable. We all, listen, we are all spiritual seekers. So we will get these insights and breakthroughs. But the breakthrough I am talking about is an Advaitic, Vedantic breakthrough about your nature as Turiyam. Your nature, has it gone away? Does it last for 30 minutes? Do you last for 30 minutes? No. So it's a breakthrough about your real nature, not any other breakthrough I am talking about. It's an insight into this Vedantic teaching. Remember when I say insight, breakthrough, I mean insight about this teaching. I am Brahman. If it's really a breakthrough, you, nothing that you can do will drive it away. It still will be there. You say, Swami, this is great. Then what else needs to be done? Oh, a lot needs to be done. This breakthrough must be made practical. May, must be, Swami Vivekananda says, at the level of speech and uh, daily actions, it must be manifested in life. You, it is still possible to say, I know the reality, but I'm still suffering. I'm still affected by the world. In Uttarakhand, they say, in the Himalayas, they were saying, uh, in Hindi it has carries more punch. You see, this is a peculiar problem of Advaitins, non-dualists. They say, Rota wa gyani kisi ko pasand nahi hai. An, an enlightened person who's still complaining and grumbling and crying, I've got this problem, that person said such and such thing to me. I have met a person, great Vedantic scholar, a, a very senior monk. Um, he was a teacher of Atma Priyanandaji. Uh, we all knew him, he has passed away long ago. Thing is, he would fly into a rage. And so, somebody asked him, Swami, you are one of the best Vedanta teachers here. He, he, and he looked the part. He had long, white flowing beard and a top knot. and things. <laughs> Very nice. And he used to be, feel very hot all the time. So, he had a little bamboo fan with which he would fan himself. And if you bow down to him, his blessings would be given with the fan. He would hit you on the head with that fan. <laughs> I also got a number of knocks. Anyway, he is really a great uh, Swami and a great teacher, but he would lose his temper really fast. So we asked him and his explanation <laughs> would be, yes, he would hear a high pitched voice, so what? He would say, so what? I see the rising of anger in the mind and the angry mind and again the peaceful mind. Well, all right, you see it, but it's, we still feel the brunt of your <laughs> anger. <laughs> so. So, I don't know, I'm with all due respect to the Swami, he's a great person, but um, it seems to be a case like this, the second group, which makes a breakthrough. Uh, but still, it has to be, your life has to be spiritualized, every aspect of your life has to be spiritualized. Shanti, yes. in case of second stage, is it possible for me to accept Thakur's gospel? The first stage you got the throng, second throng internal, you take it out. Then throw all Thorns. the light of spirituality. 
<laughs> right. No, uh, that first thorn and the second thorn, uh, that, th yeah, that applies to both. For so third state. Spiritual knowledge will take out both. Yes, it applies to both. Only the, the highest ones, they don't require any more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They are the Jeevan Muktas. But if you have a deep Vedantic, see, if Vedanta becomes more and more clear to you, and yet you honestly feel, I am not an enlightened while living, free while living, Jeevan Mukta, then you are in this stage, and then you will benefit from these practices. Let's go into those practices. There's nothing more than Vedantic meditation, and Gaurapada will talk about it in the remaining verses of this chapter. What is Vedantic meditation? Staying with the teaching. Staying with the breakthrough. Let me make it even more specific. You say, what breakthrough? All right, back to third stage. <laughs> back, back to. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, they, they, would, they would promote bright kids two classes at a time sometimes. In those days, I don't think they do it anymore. Promotion. Double promotion. So I got admitted to a new school. I still remember one of the greatest humiliations of my life. I got admitted to a new school and in the f for grade one, I think. And uh, the teacher said, uh, oh, you, you are well above this uh, level. So you go to grade two. I went to grade two and I came back home. I didn't even know it was a great thing. I came back home and told my mom. She was so delighted. She called up all the relatives and boasted about her, how on the first day of school her son had gotten promoted. So the next day I went to grade two and they said, no, 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 you can't be here. <laughs> you, you, you don't know these things. You have to go back to grade one. So I went back to grade one. It's nothing to me, but it's apparently a very big deal to my mother. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I guess I always carried a mild trauma after when I t <laughs> the reaction she had when I told her about how she would have to roll back all those <laughs> press releases releases to <laughs> no one um, great teacher whom I consider to be a f one of the few Jeevan Muktas I have met in this life enlightened by living he was a wandering monk in the Himalayas um, and in Omkarishwar. He would often say, wistfully, he would say, Satchai ka kadar karo. Satchai ka adar karo. Satchai ka adar karo. Learn to respect your truth. Apna satchai ka adar karo. Your truth means you don't have to tell anybody. We look into our own minds and we know. How, we'll see how. Where I am at. What's my level? And start there. What's the problem? You are Brahman. As much as Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, we are Brahman, as much as the greatest and, uh, Jivan Mukta who ever lived. You are already that. Now, nobody can take that away from you. You just need to polish the mirror to manifest it more. So start where you are. They give the example. Um, in the Upanishad, the three examples are like smoke covering a fire, like dust covering a mirror, and the, f the fetus being covered by a skin. Now, the three levels of obstacles. Smoke covering the fire, you just blow on it, it'll go away, and the fire blazes forth. But the mirror, it's not enough to blow. You have to polish the mirror. You have to scrub it, then it will shine. In the case of the child, you have to wait till it is born. It takes much longer. It's not all that easy. So these are the levels, and these are all the levels of obstacles at the second level. <laughs> uh, so there's a whole range there. So the, what is prescribed there is not so much karma yoga, bhakti yoga, but Vedantic meditation, the word for which is nididhyasanam. Verse number 40. We have done up to verse number 39? Yes. Manaso nigrahayattam Manaso nigrahayatam Abhayam sarva yoginam Abhayam sarva yoginam Dukkakshaya prabodhascha Dukkakshaya prabodhascha Apyakshaya shanti revacha Apyakshaya shanti revacha 40. Vedantic meditation. Manaso nigraha, control of the mind. This is the only way. This is the only way. Sarva yoginam, for all seekers. Ultimately, everybody has to come to this. Um, what was earlier called no mind is now being called control of the mind. Manaso nigraha. Sarva yoginam, for all practitioners. 
beginners, medium, advanced level, whoever is seeking enlightenment, they have to ultimately come to this point. What will it give? Prabodha. Prabodha means for enlightenment. Control of the mind is essential. And the results of enlightenment. What are the results of en enlightenment? Dukkha kshaya. Dukkha kshaya means destruction of sorrow. Transcendence of sorrow. In the, second of, in, in the sense of the second arrow. Transcendence of sorrow. Dukkha kshaya. Akshaya shanti. Endless peace. Deep, profound, everlasting, unshakable peace. Joy. Abhayam. Fearlessness. That is the sign of enlightenment. Nothing scares you anymore. What can scare you? Death doesn't hold any terrors for you. Neither death, nor insult, nor financial ruin, nor bad, bad luck, nor misbehavior of others. None of that is absolutely, it doesn't leave any trace upon you. Because you have found something which transcends all of these. These are not touched. You have found absolute security. Abhayam. In fact, in the Upanishads, Instead of enlightenment, the word fearlessness is used. When Janaka, the emperor, attains enlightenment, his guru tells him, Abhayam vai prapto si Janaka. O Janaka, O emperor, thou hast attained fearlessness. Enlightenment and true fearlessness. And this fearlessness, this enlightenment is non-dualism. There is no second reality apart from you, the Turiya, the, uh, the pure consciousness. Just the opposite is samsara. In the Upanishads, Dvitiyadvai Bhayam Bhavati. When there is a second entity apart from you, fear arises. Samsara arises. But you realize everything is I, myself. What, once you wake up from the dream, what is it in the dream? Which person, which monster scares you? Nothing. Nothing. When you are in the dream and you don't know it's a dream, a little monkey scampering around can scare you. And when you wake up from the dream, even if you are dreamt of King Kong, it still won't scare you. Why? Because you know, it is I myself which appeared in that form. So you go beyond fear. Abhayam vai praptosi. One of the signs of enlightened persons that they have absolutely no fear of anything uh, in this universe. So, prabodha, enlightenment, that depends on mano nigraha, control of the mind. And its results, destruction of sorrow, dukkha akshaya, depends on control of the mind. Akshaya shanti, endless peace, um, that is attainment of joy and peace, that also follows from control of the mind. Abhayam, fearlessness, ultimately is the result of this control of the mind. Here is going to talk about control of the mind. What he means here is Vedantic meditation, staying with that clarity, continuously for a long period of time. Mano Nigraha here, you have to relate it back to the fourfold qualifications we talked about. Specifically, you will see number three in those fourfold qualifications are the six treasures. Six treasures. They all relate to this control of the mind. What are the six treasures? Don't get confused. Fourfold qualifications, six treasures. <laughs> what are the six treasures? Shamaha, control of the mind. Literally this thing. Don't let the mind run amok. Damaha, control of the senses. Just because you have a hand doesn't mean you'll keep grasping things. Just because you have legs doesn't mean you'll keep running around. Control of the senses. They are instruments meant to be used and kept aside. Control of the, sense, uh, uh, of the senses, Damaha. Then Uparati, withdrawal from sensuousness. From sen Rati means sensual enjoyment. Withdrawal from sensual enjoyment. If you pour your psychic energy into, into the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, then there's nothing left over for Vedanta. You must withdraw from that. Of course you will eat. Of course you will eat and drink and um, watch the occasional TV show. That's all right. But it should not be that that is my source of satisfaction. And that is important in any way. No, it is not. Uparati, the opposite of Rati. Then, that mind so withdrawn now must be focused on this knowledge, Samadhan. Samadhan literally means keeping it in one place, um, collecting it and keeping it in one place, Samadhan. Then Titiksha, 
uh, spiritual fortitude. Problems will be there in the world, health problems will be there in the body. Um, sometimes the mind will be interested in Vedanta, sometimes it will not be interested. Remember, body, mind, they are all instruments. I am not here to obey the dictates of the body mind. They are here to fulfill my purpose in life. So, Tritiksha means that spiritual toughness. Come what may in life, I will pursue enlightenment. I will turn up for the Wednesday class. <laughs> yeah. well, most of you are anyway. So, that's Tritiksha. Come snow or rain, and New York can test you in many ways. Uh, traffic, whatever. I will turn up for the class. That's a, that's a spiritual toughness. To pursue your goal no matter what. And then Shraddha. Shraddha is a deep faith. It's true. It's real. I have not realized it yet. But many who have preceded me have realized it. And I must realize it too. And I will do it in this life. So this kind of faith. In the teaching. In the teacher. In myself. I will do it. I will become enlightened in this life. That's the point of life. So that is mana nigraha, control of the mind. Now, meditation, how does it have to be done? It takes a lot, it, uh, this process is a long process and it takes great patience and care and it should be done not mechanically but with joy. Utsaha is a word used that is enthusiasm. Pa uh, uh, verse number 41. Utseka Udadhir Yad Utseka No Utseka Udadhir Yadvat Utseka Udadhir Yadvat Kushagrenaika Binduna Kushagrenaika Binduna Manaso Nigraha Tadvad Manaso Nigraha Tadvad Bhaveda Parikhedata Bhaveda Parikhedata Control the mind. How? Example is given. As it's like trying to empty the ocean with, don't get scared, with a blade of grass. You know, taking a one drop by one drop. And so immediately your reaction he knows. So he, he adds Aparikhedata without feeling frustrated. <laughs> Now, what does this mean? Let's understand this. The mind, what is the mind? We're going to deal with the mind now. So, what is the mind? Very simply put, it is vrittis, movements in the mind, thoughts, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas. All of them are called vritti, modification of the mind stuff. The mind, there are thoughts arising every moment in our mind. So, it goes like this. Each of them is a Vritti. And this is the mind. The sum total of all of this is the mind. Each vritti has a content. Each movement of the mind. Content means um, it's about something. In Western philosophy it is said mind is intentional. It Intentional means it, it, it is about something. So when you're thinking, the mind is not thinking about itself. You're thinking pen. So you, the thought in your mind about pen is about this pen. The thought in your mind is about what the Swami said. So thoughts are about something. This in, in uh, yoga or in Vedanta is put in this way. Each vritti, each thought in the mind has a content. Content means what is it about. So here is a thought about ice cream. Here is a thought about um, car parking, you know. And here is a thought about Vedanta. It's hot. Can I have a, a little bit of ice cream? Yeah. And is, is my parking meter paid up? Oh, back to Vedanta. What is the Swami saying? I missed a little bit. So this is how the mind goes. The mind flickers continuously. And uh, the control of the mind means, basically what control of the mind is, to regulate the contents of these vrittis. If the fourfold qualification is there, then these vrittis will always be about high and, uh, and, and noble, the contents will be about spiritual reality, about Vedanta, about, you know, or God, or who am I, or... But if, it, if the mind is not sufficiently pure, if the fourfold qualification is not strong enough, what will happen is, 
the mind will be full of vrittis about a lot of worldly stuff. It could, would be about my house, about that person, what that person did to me, um, and back to Vedanta again, and back to the world again. This is how it goes. Yes. Our contact with the world and our own samskaras, where do these thoughts emanate from? The mind is always thinking. When the mind is awake, awake means vritti will be there. Now, your question is, if you pre- make your question more precise, why are these thoughts about these things, if you are asking that? Where do thoughts emanate? answer will be from the mind. No, no, why these thoughts? These thoughts are from your contact with the world. What you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, obviously. And your mental predispositions, your samskaras. So if the mind is full of spiritual samskaras, it will keep coming back to spiritual topics. No matter what comes from the world, you will relate it back to that. If the mind is very worldly, you may hear a spiritual talk once in a while, but it will leave. They say it's like water falling on a hot pan. Flash, it's gone. Pan is so hot with worldliness, it will only take... Worldly impressions and finds great joy, even in worldly suffering. You try to take away suffering and give peace to such a mind, the mind finds it boring. Yeah. When is the next problem coming? <laughs> so, uh, these vittis come from our own conditioning in contact with the world. Our own conditioning is most important because even the enlightened person, the spiritual person, is also to some extent in contact with the world. Whoever is living is in contact with the world. All right. Now these vrittis are there for everybody, for all spiritual seekers. Enlightened person, for those who are in the second middle ground, for those who are at the beginning, all of us, we have vrittis. The problem with these vrittis is, they are internal, first person. We are aware of it. And so there is always in spiritual life, in the case of Mano Nigra, control of the mind, is this problem of hypocrisy, of deluding oneself. I can think of myself as a spiritual person, I can pose as a spiritual person, but if I entertain vrittis which are about the world, then inside, where it counts, I'm not really spiritual. My thoughts are about the world. So this is hypocrisy in spiritual life. In Gita, Sri Krishna says, Mithyachara Saucyate, a person who gives up worldly pursuits, sits quietly in a mountain cave, and yet the mind keeps on thinking about the world, that is, uh, that is, uh, he calls it hypocrisy. So what we should do, to some extent or the other, this problem is there for all of us. Otherwise, we would be enlightened. Straight away. A mind is absolutely pure. What it takes up as real, it will pursue it. It will not get distracted here and there. We get distracted because things keep pulling us. It doesn't matter if these vittis come to our mind. If I am a spiritual seeker, here is the thing. What is Mano Nigraha, control of mind? How do I react to those vittis? If I keep strengthening them, if I let my mind dwell on worldly things, then that makes me more and more worldly and less and less spiritual. If I react, I note, oh, this is not, um, this is not according to my spiritual goal. I let go of that and substitute it with a spiritual thought. So whenever a thought comes, I deal with it. I don't let my mind dwell on it. I try to dwell on, on my spiritual goal. So more and more I put my mind on Vedanta, on, on uh, oh, whatever your spiritual practice is. That is real Mano Nigraha at, the, at its core, at its heart. What I do externally, whether I sit like this, whether I stand in one, on one leg, whether I put on uh, a, a, a Gerua dress or not. Uh, there are so many marks which monks in India or priests they put on. Those are external aids. That is not all that important. They are aids. They help. But the point is the vrittis. What are the vrittis about? Are those vrittis about uh, the six, they call again the six, four, six and so on. The six enemies. Kama, sensual pleasures. Am I thinking about that? Are the vrittis about that? Krodha, anger, flash of anger. I am angry with different people or somebody. And I keep thinking about that. That is a world, worldly vritti. Krodha. Lova, greed. I want more and more of something. It could be money, it could be food, it could be something. Am I thinking about that? Lova. Mother, arrogance. 
प्राइड एरोगेंस मात सर या जेलसी जेलसी मोह डिल्यूशन डिल्यूशन आई एम द बॉडी माइंड I keep thinking and behaving as if I am this body mind. So the six they call the six great shudderipu the six six great enemies and if I allow them to pervade my mind then the mind is a worldly mind. Kama krodha lobha moha madha matsarya kama sensuous thoughts replace these sensuous thoughts with maybe thoughts of my ishta devata i want but not the world i want god anger krodha krodha is anger replace anger this is no righteous anger even if it is righteous anger it's still anger whatever the issue in your life you can deal with it without being angry you can it's a so i vivekananda said it's a fool who cannot get angry it's a wise person who does not get angry so anger has to be managed has to be transcended krodha overcome anger by peace beautiful statement in the dhamma pada akodhena jine kodham in pali krodha the sanskrit krodha becomes kodha kodha means anger by non anger by serenity overcome anger very simple but it's a very beautiful statement akodhena jine kodham <laughs> then um, lobha by the thoughts of self control overcome the thoughts of uh, acquisition greed i have acquired so much the buddhists have a very nice meditation to deal with greed they say imagine imagine how much we have eaten imagine the last meal you had the you know it's in india the rice and the dal and the, and the vegetables in your plate and imagine the meal you had last night add it to that so more rice and more dal <laughs> and the meal that you had in the afternoon yesterday and all the food that you have eaten throughout the week rice and <laughs> dal a whole buckets of them imagine the food that you have eaten last year now it can't be kept within the house you have to take it out to the lawn <laughs> and imagine the food that i have eaten in 20 years of life 40 years of life from my babyhood mountains of rice lakes of dal and and heaps and heaps truck loads of vegetables and and bushels of sugar and and so on you think this is some kind of demon you know we say rakshasa de- demon is it no i am the demon who has eaten all of that uh, and it's a fact nobody can deny it all of that has been poured into this body mind system for what what have you got to show for that let alone what the world has got from you what have you got from it are you at peace have you have you found joy are you happy no think about it and it's a fact it's not imagination it's exactly the fact of our life we just don't think about it so th- this is a meditation on overcoming greed overcoming anger overcoming sensuous desires for sensuous pleasures overcoming pride overcoming arrogance and the delusion of being a body mind and seeking um, satisfaction in this physical material world after all that food how much satisfaction remains now within a few hours i'll be hungry again feed me feed me <laughs> no this is this is not the way to happiness so uh so he says this has to be carefully done replace all these vrittis these negative vrittis with positive ones starve the negative vrittis encourage and nourish the positive ones for that a lot can be done change your environment sri ramakrishna would see if he went to somebody's house and he saw the pictures of you know the hindu gods and goddesses you know he would be happy because this creates a sattvic is a small input into the mind but still an input play uh, spiritual music sublime music when you're at home so replace worldly samskaras with positive samskaras you will see whatever happens about enlightenment later on right now you'll be happy straight away within one day you'll be happy the mind will be more relaxed more peaceful um, 
more healthy. So this is Mano Nigraha. And this is the way it has to be done little by little over a long period of time. Don't get upset. The mind is very delicate. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine instrument. They say meditation is like if you hold a bowl of water full to the brim and you, have to, you are not allowed to spill a single drop, how carefully you must hold it. That's how you must sit physically so that the mind will not be disturbed. Even the slightest movement of the body, the slightest um, irregularity of the breath, all of that disturbs the mind, mind immediately, throws it out into waves. So that much care, alertness has to be maintained. There is a story um, about this. Why he has given this? Kushagra means one blade of grass, the tip of a blade of grass. At the most you can pick up one drop of water from the ocean. So the old myth, myth is there, Indian story is there from the Puranas, that there's a little, little bird which laid a couple of eggs and it got into some kind of trouble with the ocean. The ocean was a big bully. So the ocean came and swept over the eggs and the eggs were swept out into the ocean or into the sea. And the poor bird was so miserable, it couldn't find its eggs, it knew it was under the ocean. What could it do? It begged and begged and the ocean wouldn't listen. The bully, give back my eggs. No. Then the bird said, out of desperation, what can I do? Then I'm going to empty you. And the ocean laughed, ha, you are going to empty me. And the bird flew away, got a blade of grass and picked up a drop of water from the ocean and threw it on the beach. Went back again, picked up another drop of water and threw it on the beach and went on and on. Until it was exhausted, it would recover its strength and start all over again. The ocean was, of course, not concerned. <laughs> what can the bird do to me? It will die long before it makes any dent in me. I'm so big and powerful. But, but, when you help yourself, God helps you. So high above, in Vaik Vaikuntha, the abode of the Lord, where Vishnu, Narayana, the Lord of the universe, his mount is, his private jet, you know, Gulf Stream, <laughs> is, is the, is the gr great bird Garuda. I think Indonesia's airline is called Garuda Airlines. Yeah. It's the great bird Garuda. Um, it's, a, it's a mighty, uh, like the mighty eagle. So this divine bird, it saw, after all the bird is its, its cousin after all, you know. <laughs> so it saw this poor bird and saw everything with its divine eye, it saw what was going on. And he was indignant and couldn't take this torture anymore. So he swooped down in all his glory and power till the whole world, uh, the skies were th thrown into you know, atmospheric disturbance, hurricanes by the flapping of his winds. And he swooped down to the ocean, the ocean looked up in terror. And this bird came, mighty bird, and it flapped its wings a couple of times. And the ocean water began to get evaporated. And the ocean, in, in terror, asked, Oh, mighty one, why are you doing this to me? And Garuda said, Return the eggs of, <laughs> of my little brother, of my little sister. Um, the ocean said, Yes, of course, sir, whatever you want, and gave the eggs back. Now, what it means is, it's not as impossible as it looks. Set to work with a, with a clear, unflinching intent, divine grace comes. The problem which you are dealing with, which seems like an ocean, it, it will be immediately transformed. Mira sings, the great poet uh, Mira, she sings about Mere to Giridhara Gopala, Dusra na koi. For me, there is only Krishna in the form of Gopala, nobody else. I know only Krishna. That's the non duality of devotion. Nothing else except Krishna, then the baby Krishna, Gopala. And there is a line there, Suk Gaya Bhava Sagar, Fikar Nahi Taranamki. The ocean of the world has, this, has, been, uh, has dried up. I have no fear of the waves. I have no fear of crossing over now. How has the ocean of the world dried? Ocean of the world means samsara. For me it's gone. How is it gone? Because of the grace of God. You start with, Mira starts with a little uh, blade of grass, but she is helped by God. And so it's no longer a problem. It's easily overcome. Every day we sing Arati, uh, the song to Sri Ramakrishna, Bhava Goshpada Vari Jatha. At the end of the song, it is said, By your grace, even the Bhava Sagar, the, the ocean of worldly existence, it becomes as small as the puddle of water which collects in the Hoof print of a cow. Hoof print, when the cow walks and makes a hoof print, as much water as can collect there. It's as easy as crossing that. By the grace of God. 
without the grace of god blade of grass and one drop at a time so that's the beautiful example but i was reminded of a story um not as grand as the story of garuda but it was a, a joke which i had read in an old readers digest um dating back to the second world war the ashram where we were where, where, where i joined they had old magazines and stuff in the library to so 1940s so a joke about churchill and mussolini and hitler so the joke uh, is it goes like this so churchill and mussolini and hitler for us it's all uh, stories not for bill <laughs> he he is a world war 2 veteran he flew bombers in the pacific theater so he actually experienced all that uh, so churchill and hitler and mussolini they have a meeting when the war has just started just before the war starts or something like that it's not true it's a joke it never happened so they're meeting in a sea seaside resort and uh, um churchill tells mussolini and hitler to back down from their unreasonable demands and they say no and uh, churchill say, and says you should surrender you can never stand up to us and churchill says we'll never surrender and so on finally churchill proposes this it's a joke bill is looking confused it never happened i'm telling a joke <laughs> one second word <laughs> you're thinking about did i wake up to an alternate reality or something <laughs> no this is just a joke so churchill proposes a challenge he says there are little fish in that pool it's a very clear pool little fish in that pool the first one to catch it uh, that person is the winner and his what he says should be done hitler says ha that's very easy and it whips out his revolver and shoots at the pool but you know he can't really shoot under water it it gets diffracted so he misses with every shot he misses the little fish and the fish just slips away mussolini says enough i'll do it and he takes off his coat and his boots and he jumps into the pool and he swims but he is heavy and slow and the fish is small and slippery and slips out of his grasp every time he's trying to catch it and he huffing and puffing he comes out of the pool he has finished uh, and he, he can't do anything so both of them say what about you and they don't think that churchill can't do anything because he's so old and fat and out of shape what can he do he doesn't have a gun he can't swim so churchill what he does is he gets up from where he was sitting he takes the teaspoon from his tea cup and he goes and takes out a spoon of water and throws it then he takes out a spoon of water and throws it and takes out another one hitler and mussolini are looking at each other what is he doing hitler shouts at him you fool it will take you a thousand years to empty the pool in this way and churchill says yes it may take us a thousand years but we'll never give up until you are defeated and wiped out from the face of this earth so this this is the <laughs> but it is how it matches with this this kind of determination okay uh old readers digest joke <laughs> war time joke now so is patience all that is necessary i keep watching my vrittis and keep re- replacing them with positive ones no there are techniques is coming now so he says you use with this kind of intent diamond hard intent that i will control the mind bring it under control take a resort to yogic techniques remember before we go into this vedantic meditation can be done with eyes closed it can be done with eyes open also studying is also vedantic meditation shravana stay with your the teaching hear it again and again that's also vedantic meditation discussing it with each other that's also vedantic meditation just thinking about the vedantic truth that's also vedantic meditation while working that verse we have in the gita brahma arpanam brahmahavi which says you convert your every action into vedantic meditation brahma karma samadhi look at the word used there brahma karma samadhi the one who sees brahman in every action so while doing action also vedantic meditation is possible but one of the most powerful ways of doing vedantic meditation is using patanjali's yoga so what vedanta does careful they do not subscribe to patanjali's uh, yoga philosophy because patanjali's yoga philosophy is dualistic prakriti purusha what vedanta does is it dismisses patanjali's philosophy 
but takes the techniques. It takes the techniques and adapts it to Vedantic meditation. So what, what is the method of uh, meditation in Patanjali Yoga? Eight steps or eight limbs. Ashtanga Yoga. Yama, Niyama, tell me. Yama and Niyama are the moral practices. Then Asana, sitting, posture. Here posture is important. Here you cannot walk around, drive or do things. No, posture is important. So uh, asana. Then pranayama. Control of the breath. Regulation of the breath. Why? Because the breath is closely connected with the mind. Heavy breathing, fast breathing, excited mind. Calm and, uh, and rhythmic breathing, calm mind. So pranayama. And there are pranayama itself is a science. Asana itself is a science. It was, you know, the, all the yoga studios and all, they are all about pranayama and asana, these two only. So, asana and pranayama. Then, pratyahara, withdrawal of the mind from its connection with the senses. Turning the mind inwards, basically. Then, dharana, focus. Focus on whatever you are meditating upon. Focus. In this case, what, what, what is the focus? The Vedantic understanding, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. Then, then what happens? That focus deepens into dhyana, meditation. First, the focus is intermittent. Vedanta, parking ticket, Vedanta. Then it's Vedanta, Vedanta, Vedanta. <laughs> so it becomes fo focused. And then dhyana, meditation results. And that dhyana hopefully will deepen into samadhi. Samadhi. And samadhi again is of different types. So this is the Vedantic meditation based on Patanjali Yoga. That's what he's going to talk about. Upaya. He just mentions upaya, method. Be methodical about it. He's not going to give us a detailed description of meditation. No. This is not meant for that. This is Mandukya. This is the tip of the, this is the peak of the Everest. You want detailed descriptions of meditation and of processes and what to do and what not to do. Patanjali Yoga is there. Uh, and there are many texts which, which tell you what to do. This is, he just touches upon it and then goes ahead. Verse number 42. Upayena nigrinhyad Upayena nigrinhyad Vikshiptam kama bhogayo Vikshiptam kama bhogayo Suprasannam laye chaiva Suprasannam laye chaiva Yatha kamo layastatha, Yatha kamo layastatha, Upayena nigrinhyat. By that little phrase, he has given you the entirety, permission to follow the entirety of Patanjali Yoga. Import everything, copy and paste. <laughs> no question of uh, uh, what is called uh, copyright in those days. So every, it was, knowledge was free. Copy and paste. Use it, but fit it to your non dualistic philosophy. Upayena nigrinyad, bring your mind under control methodically, not just by patience, one drop by one drop, that's of course necessary, that's most important, but upaya, follow a method, follow the method taught by your guru, your guru has given you a mantra and a way to meditate, that's good enough, that's good enough, now do that, when you do that, so will it work, will my mind come under control, will I be enlightened, aham brahma me, wait a minute, there are problems. You say, ah, I knew it. <laughs> what kind of problems are you likely to face? There are four kinds which Gaudapada mentions and gives you the remedy for them. So what are the obstacles? To what? To Vedantic meditation. So there are four main obstacles. One is Laya. Yeah, precisely that, yawning. That's, that's the first obstacle. <laughs> then, second one is Vikshepa. Vikshepa is basically, Laya is basically, what, what was going on? That's Laya. And Vikshepa is, when will this end? <laughs> Impatient mind, scattered mind. Then Kashaya, I'll explain. Kashaya. Then number four is Rasaswada, tasting of bliss, 
kashaya is stupefaction or stunned mind and um, or immobilized mind basically and rasaswada is tasting bliss now what are these obstacles and how do you overcome them first one is laya tired mind drowsy mind sleepy mind why is that a problem in meditation it is for multiple reasons one could be which is more more applicable to us here in this city city that never sleeps yogis would be horrified a certain amount of sleep is necessary for the body mind system and so they say regulated life a routine life is absolutely essential for meditation uh, is for a yogi's life balanced diet balanced routine harmonious satvic life otherwise meditation becomes a struggle so one of the components of this balanced diet is balanced life is sleep not too much not too little most for most people at least 6 hours or more so again but that does not mean 10 hours but that does not mean the manhattan equivalent of 2 hours a night <laughs> no so you if the mind body is sleep deprived you can pass your days filled with starbucks but med- something like meditation which is very um a uh, very very subtle satvik when you calm down settle the body down and calm your mind immediately the sleep deficit will take over and you'll fall asleep the mind says ah good time <laughs> to make up for my sleep the guy is not doing anything much time to sleep <laughs> meditation or vedanta class somewhere <laughs> wednesday 4 pm good time to sleep so <laughs> uh sleep deficit that's one problem uh another is illness it could be whether it's the flu or do you are uh, uh, stomach problem something some kind of imbalance in the body where the body is not doing too well it affects the mind immediately and you try to meditate you'll feel drowsy sleepy sluggish old age combination of all of this that can act- actually affect also So we have seen meditators who have meditated for decades and decades very well they can continue to do so in old age but if your meditation is not already well established once old age begins to take over a lot of problems in the body will become drowsy weakness is there drowsiness is there it's just the body it's nothing to ter- to be terribly worried about um bad habits bad habits in the sense when we sit down for meditation it's almost like going to sleep so the body feels so this guy is not moving okay he's closing his eyes ah what does this mean dark room quiet no sound closing eyes sleep but body goes to sleep <laughs> that's how we have trained the body i remember one of our swamis when we were novices it was tough you had to get up at 3:40 a.m. in the morning and it was hot and sweaty and you would have missed sleep at night and we were young and strong at that time but still it would be really tough and we would go to the temple you had to because otherwise somebody would come politely and ring the bell near your ear until you <laughs> went up to the temple to meditate but in the temple now you are all alone by yourself nobody is going to disturb you so <laughs> off you go like this <laughs> they used to joke i don't know this doesn't translate too well into english there is a verse which says pranamami muhur muhu i salute this the moment to moment every moment i salute this so i salute the, i salute the every moment i one senior swami one of our teachers i still remember he is to he is to plaintively say don't go to sleep immediately <laughs> struggle with it other actually otherwise it becomes a bad habit so the body learns that oh this is the time for sleep no it's not the time for sleep um the opposite vikshepa vikshepa is scattered mind mind has not gone to sleep but it is scattered i want to see this i want to hear that this is so boring i'm wasting my time i should go and read some vedanta this trick of the mind it's not going to read vedanta also <laughs> the moment you let it get up from the meditation seat and you say all right read vedanta then you feel sleepy uh, you're not doing much good i remember They were, my brothers were there you know cleaning the temples on the side of the river ganga 
I was sitting in meditation. I said, I should have spent my time working. Even that manual labor is better than this useless struggle. You know, I, uh, my mind just going, going every which way. That's the trick of the mind. Weak shape, a scattered mind, who doesn't want you to sit quietly in meditation. Bring it back. There is to be a big clock in the meditation room. And often you will find the novices, you know, sitting for meditation, once a while looking at the clock. <laughs> How much longer? Scattered mind. The other one is laya, which is, which is, laya means merged mind. Well, that sounds nice, he's merged in sleep. <laughs> so that guy is not looking at the clock, he's out of it. But this guy is looking at the clock because Young, energetic man, how, how many hours can you sit, make him sit quietly? But that's weak shape, that's scattered mind. Bring it back, focus again. Um, so, the, the solution for scattered mind is concentration. There are many uh, minor techniques. For example, I'll just give you one example. Because this is not a manual of meditation, so details are not touched upon. It is talking about something far higher. Just touches upon it and goes ahead. For example, mind is dull and feeling sleepy. One of the subtle ways of, of um, dealing with it, subtle ways, internal ways, when I'm imagining, say, the form of my Ishta Devata, Krishna, I'm visualizing the deity. If the mind is becoming dull, make the deity light, bright, you know, blazing forth, shining. That has a subtle image into the subconscious and the mind awakens. If the mind is scattered here and there, going here and there, Make the image heavy like a stone and solid and deep. The mind again begins to settle down. These are subtle messages. These may be too subtle. Our pro problems may be much more gross than that. So in that case, sleepiness, get up, wash your face, come back and sit down. Or walk back and forth, repeat the mantra to yourself. So, I remember an extreme case. One monk, a novice, I, I saw this actually. Uh, he was one of the most energetic young no uh, monks I have ever seen. And meditation for one hour, two hours early in the morning was, must have been a torture to that guy. He was so up and doing. So he, he couldn't take it anymore. He was sitting there for meditation and he saw this younger, uh, more junior novice. You can't say anything to the seniors. You can say something to the juniors. The junior novice is uh, like anybody else, like this. And so this monk says, this, this novice, uh, he does, in the darkness, imagine a huge hall, dark, filled with monks sitting and meditating. So this monk goes, <gasps> waking him up. Hey! And so this young novice is, okay, a senior novice is telling him, tries to sit and again becomes like that. Hey! And it goes on for one hour. After three days of this, the new novice can't take it anymore. So he changes his seat, goes <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> Next day, this, and it actually happened. This, um, this novice who has been, who has found a nice occupation. See, his problem, that per person's problem is number one, liar. And the second one is problem is number two, Vikshepa. <laughs> he has found an occupation now to make that other guy meditate. <laughs> so he sits and meditates and he finds this spot is empty. He's not there. He starts looking around, where is he gone? <laughs> And this guy, poor guy, who had shifted to a different place in the meditation hall, suddenly finds a rustling and the other monk is coming and sitting behind him now. <laughs> to take care of his meditation. A couple of days of that, and then the, this young novice couldn't be found in the hall. And this monk actually got up, put his meditation mat, a mat under his arm, started walking outside the temple to see. And lo and behold, that young novice was hiding in a corner and behind a pillar and trying to meditate there. And he comes and sits down behind him. <laughs> No talking. No. <laughs> and it went to such an extent that that young novice stopped coming to the temple. He went to the bank of the river to meditate, where he found this other monk following him there. <laughs> and, and this is not exaggerated. There are many, many uh, witnesses to this thing. So that is Vikshepa, where you take up the job of making the other guy meditate properly. <laughs> Kashaya is um, an immobilized mind. What happens is, see, long before Freud, they understood this. Deep disturbances and imbalances in the body and mind, especially subconscious mind. A trauma, a, a complex, uh, some kind of guilt, inferiority complex, a hurt, um, um, something remains suppressed for many, many years maybe. But meditation uncovers these layers. And so that monster sleeping underneath which I have ignored, 
You cannot really ignore it. Freud discovered that. And they, it manifests in different ways. But in meditation especially, these things get released. So it can be quite dangerous. So sometimes it comes and catches your mind. And you are as if stunned by the enormity of whatever trauma that you have undergone in the past. It could be something has been done to you or you could have done something. It could be guilt, it could be shame, it could be um, unhappiness, it could be suffering. It will come and catch the mind. And the mind is simply, it's like being poisoned. So it becomes paralyzed as it were. It's not doing anything. It has not fallen asleep. It's not at all scattered. It is completely concentrated, but only on that horror. Only on that unhappiness. And it stays like that. What do you do there? One way uh, is uh, witness. Watch the, the, that, that complex, that whirlpool of um, thoughts. And your mind unable to meditate being there. Just watch it. It's also an experience. You have studied Mandukya. You are the consciousness in which this is also appearing. It comes and goes. It is nothing to you. Stay like that for some time. That thing begins to lose its power over you. That's the witness consciousness way. Mandukya way. But there is a more powerful way. Which Godapada will not mention. It is um, a surrender to God. Pray intensely to the Lord. Whichever form you believe in. By the grace of God, sometimes those knots become untied. Especially the grace of the Divine Mother. Yes. But then there will be a problem getting rid of the God later on. What? There will be a problem getting rid of the God later on. No, don't get rid of God. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not get, get rid of God. Um, that, see, if you, have, if you have come to the earlier classes, you will see. What is Ishwara? It is that consciousness with the power of Maya. It is none other than Turiya, with the power of Maya. You, you and God have the same reality. You are Jiva, that is Ishwara. Really speaking, you are neither Jiva nor is that Ishwara. That is also Turiya, you are also Turiya. You are supposed to realize that. You don't have to get rid of it. Take the help of God. Yes. Shamiji, in that case that Freud or somebody that said trauma or something like that, you can get rid of that if you see the, all the writers. They also feel other sufferings their own way. Other way you cannot paint the picture correctly. To sufferings you have to put inside. That her suffering is my suffering. Mm. Then you can release that in composing something what ability you have. That is that true. That is also true. Okay. Some people some people it's called bibliotherapy. By reading or writing. Um, All the writers often well. often literature is a good therapy. So there are many, many ways. Okay. Freudian psychoanalysis was supposed to be a therapy. So, so when you express that, bring it out and talk about it, uh, that's also, that also may release it. But here, the why the devotional aspect has not been stressed is because it's not really part of this paradigm. So they don't talk about it. But as sadhaka, we should take help wherever it is available. That is kashaya. And then the last one is rasaswada. This is rare. But what happens is, for people whose minds are pure and have are established in their meditation practice, a time of gladness, peace, serenity and joy descends upon the mind. It's restful, it's relaxed. You're awake, not sleeping, not scattered. The mind is sattvic, alert, awake and very glad. You can stay for a long time in that state, but it's not spiritual. How do you know it's not spiritual? Because it comes and goes. It will also go away. It has come because the mind is sattvic, you have no particular problems and you are a good meditator. So the mind, the mind is relaxed and happy. Rasa swada, tasting rasa, bliss. You are not supposed to do that. Remember, what is the purpose of Vedantic meditation? What is the purpose of your upasana? Concentrating on Ishta Devata. Not enjoying bliss. Not enjoying this peace of mind. Concentrating on the Ishta Devata. If you are practicing Vedantic meditation, staying with the knowledge. I am Brahman, even this, this peace of the mind, I am a witness to that. So that should be the practice, not just relaxing into the happiness, a gladness. That happens, I have seen it happen. I have mentioned here, uh, we saw this monk uh, who, I can still remember, I mean this is quite admirable really, how he would come and sit early in the morning, absolutely straight, like a Buddha, and one hour, one, hour, one and a half, two hours daily, and he was so peaceful, you could see it. Uh, in his talk, in his walk and everything. And we really thought he's a great meditator until a much more senior Swami who is 
um, whom most of us considered to be spiritually awakened, he told us, he said, oh, his whole problem is that he has found peace already. <laughs> what does that mean? What's wrong with finding peace? If you find peace in something which will ultimately not last, it's still a piece of the particular condition of the mind. You are a monk and a good one at that. You have no problems in life. Body is healthy. Mind is sattvic, is pure. So it is peaceful. It's naturally peaceful. But none of that is going to last. Old age is coming to overtake you. Mind undergoes many changes. Until you are enlightened, until you realize that you are not this body and mind, there is no safety. So his whole problem is that he has already found peace. I still remember. It's better than most of the other things, but still it's not spiritual. So what do you do? You arouse your mind out of that peaceful static state and again come bring it back to I am the Brahm, I am the witness consciousness, I am Turiya, I am Brahman. Stay with it. Not as a mantra, actually the knowledge, your awareness of that, stay with it. But will the peace not eventually lead him to enlightenment? No, no, no. Peace will not lead you. Enlightenment comes only from knowledge. I am Brahman. I am the witness of the three states which come and go. That, that is real peace. If you remember the seventh mantra of the Mandukya, Shantam. The name of the Atman itself is Shantam. But the mind's Shanti, it can come and go. It comes and goes. It's a good state, but not stable. Uh, Maharaj, in Gita second chapter, the Prasad is Sarva Dukhanam, hmm. Super hmm. the mind that is in Prasad, hmm. that is able to take the knowledge. True. But that, this, is, this is not the prasada. Prasada comes from the, the presence of God in the mind. Prasada it comes from the presence of God. When you are dwelling on the Ishta Devata in your mind, meditating, that leads to a spiritual joy. That, that kind of mind can take the knowledge. But this mind is already satisfied, at peace with itself. It doesn't want to be disturbed. It doesn't want to be shaken. It's nice. Why disturb it? But no, that's not the point. It can become a habit, an addictive habit. So one gets addicted to this kind of meditation, but that's not the uh, ultimate purpose of meditation. And this person can, huh, another thing, this person can get terribly uh, annoyed. Um, I have actually seen it happen. One phone call, enough to set off <laughs> irritation. So gets irritated by the pressure, what you would consider as nothing. A little problem in the world, somebody behaving a little badly, a little noise in the street. No. Because the mind is so peaceful, he expects a shanti within and outside. And if you take it away from him, he's addicted to that. Uh, irritation comes. Yes. Swami, this Vedantic meditation, would it be the same as uh, repeating your mantra and focusing on your Ishtadeta? No, here it is staying with the Vedantic knowledge, I am Brahman. What has, what has come out of all your study and reasoning, staying with that. That breakthrough, stay with that. What you are talking about, I am talking strictly in Gaudapada's paradigm. What you are talking about, for him it will come in that first stage, Upasana. Ishta Devata, Mantra, Repetition, where we are doing all of that to gain fitness. To purify, for, mind, to purify. purify the mind and fitness of the mind. Fourfold qualification will generate in the mind. But that's Gaudapada's point of view. But that's not our point of view. If you see Swami Saradananda in the Sri Ramakrishna, the great master, the divine play of Sri Ramakrishna, where he describes what happens in sadhana. This is a chapter at the very beginning. So a mantra, Ishta Devata, concentration on that, repeating that. At first it's an attempt of imagination. Then it becomes deep, concentrated. And then you have the living realization of the deity. And that takes you to the formless. He says very clearly. First Savikalpa Samadhi, then Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And then that takes you to the formless, the non-dual. He says very clearly, it will take you to that non-dual realization also. And this is very much in tune with Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita it says, concentrate on me, Krishna says, on me, by my grace, you shall attain to knowledge. Knowledge means enlightenment. So that's the scenic route, through Bhagavan, through God. This is what Gaudapada promises is straight, a, a, a rocket trip to the moon. <laughs> so, but with its attendant dangers and difficulties. You, you are staying with, not repeating, you are staying with the not. Suppose I want to stay with the awareness, I am Sarva Priyananda. It's like that. I have realized I am the witness of the three, the mind, uh, of the mind and body. I am the witness of the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. They arise, they stay and they disappear in me, the awareness. It's a fact. 
not a repetition. It's actually a fact. I stay with that fact. Why you need to stay with the fact is, even though it's a fact to me, when I work and talk and walk in daily life, I behave as if I'm a mind body. So there is a dissonance between what I now understand and I believe and convince to be the fact and the way I'm behaving in the world. The way I'm behaving in the world is due to my past conditioning. That has to be changed. So that is the work of Vedantic meditation, Nidhid Dhyasana. Yeah. Unless I have that breakthrough, that unshakable clarity and conviction, the very material for this meditation is not there. What will you th think about? If you're going to repeat Om, then repeat your mantra, even better. Yes, the I'll come to you. The question about the Vedantic meditation that you just described, does it require for you to sit in a place quietly and do it? Or you can do it also during... The as, I said, as I said earlier, Vedantic meditation can be done in any way. But this one he's talking about sitting in a place and doing it. Yogic meditation. Yogic meditation, you cannot do it while walking around. Vedantic meditation, there are forms. What is Vedantic med What is practice of that knowledge? Panchadashi says, Tat chintanam tat kathanam, parasparam tat prabodhanam, etad brahma paratvam hi, etad eka paratvam hi, brahma abhyasam vidur buddha. This is considered to be practice of Brahman, literally, by the wise. What is it? Tat kathanam, talking about that. Clearly, you are not sitting quietly. You are talking about it. You are studying it. You are teaching it. That's Vedantic meditation. Tat chintanam, thinking about it, continuously keeping your mind there. This is very different from, it actually takes more commitment than I repeat the mantra a thousand times in the morning, thousand times in the evening, in between, world. <laughs> no, 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 all the time. It is a fact. Like my eyes, whatever I'm seeing, if I'm aware of, I'm, what, that I'm seeing, I'm, my awareness is not on the object, but I use the object to become aware of the seeing, of the eyes. Like that, become aware of awareness. When can you become aware of awareness? Let me ask you. When can you become, by seeing what will you know that you've got eyes? Anything. By seeing what will you know that this is a pen? By seeing the pen? By seeing what will you know that this is a hand? By seeing the hand? By seeing what will you know that you have got eyes? Anything. Pen? Anything. Eyes? No, anything. The very fact that you are seeing is direct proof that it, I, have, I have eyes. The very fact that you are experiencing, for a person who has understood what Vedanta is, the very fact that you are experiencing is direct proof that you are awareness, you are Chaitanya, you are Turiya. If you understand what eyes are, by seeing anything you will become aware that you are the eyes, you have the eyes. If you understand what Vedanta is, what all this we have done, if that clarity is there, any experience will reveal to you, if you are alert, that you are that pure consciousness. Besides talking uh, spiritual things, then these things will bother you. Yes, Sri Ramakrishna would be immersed in, in, in talk of God, in spirituality. All the time you have to right, right. Mind is already, and it you, it right, right, right. If you have gotten taste of something higher, then that which is lower, will you will find it uh, uh, irritating. You may indulge in it for the sake of others who are around you, but quickly you will take them to, will try to channel them to something that is higher. All right. So, uh, did somebody else have their hand? Yes. I just want to uh, just a little clarification. So, I had taken it to 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 mean that if you are following the witness self and uh, introspection and this thing and through Gyan uh, Yoga, a sort of peacefulness will naturally come. A sort of stability will come. So that is a state, and then one should go further. No, that peaceful that, is, that peacefulness, that stability is not wrong. That's not rasaswada. Here, what has happened is that person has let go of that witness consciousness. It's just enjoying a peaceful mind. That person has let go of that awareness. I am the wit. If you say, "Here is a peaceful mind shining in me, the consciousness," that's still you're doing the Vedantic meditation. If you just say, "How nice, peaceful, good," <laughs> then you have let go of the meditation, okay. uh, and it can become an ad addiction. You have to see such people to understand. And it, it seems quite very spiritual, seems very nice. And they may themselves not know. Yeah. Like yeah. They became like detached, like 
oh, I don't care. I'm just that also could be an alienated. Okay. That means uh, like a witness of everything. But that's not the true witness. It's just a state of the mind. The true witness, you don't have, it's, there's no choice there. It's a choiceless thing. You just become aware of the fact that you are always the witness. But you're trying to be the witness. And sometimes you succeed. That is the mind itself. That will, it, it will lose it again. If suffering becomes intense enough, if the temptation becomes intense enough, no longer witness, witness gone. Yeah. So these are obstacles. If you ask what is the particular technique of Vedantic meditation, there are many. If you remember Rig Drishya Vivek, we had done six techniques. Six techniques of Vedanta, Vedantic meditation. Three internal, three external. I will not go into that. Panchadashi has a number of techniques. Um, Aparok Shanubhuti talks about uh, 15 steps where he uses yogic terms and converts them into Advaitic meditation. So in many ways, this Mandukya itself has a technique. A, Uma, Om, using that waking, dreaming, deep sleep and the silence beyond Om represents the consciousness in which waking, dreaming, deep sleep are coming and going. So these are, this is Vedantic meditation. Now if you look at the verse. Upayena nigrinhyat. Control the mind with technique. What technique? No, yama, niyama, all those things. You take it from yoga and practice it. This is with, with sitting, with eyes closed. What are, what are the problems? Vikshiptam. This problem number two. Scattered. Where is it scattered? Kama bhogayaha. By thoughts of desirous objects, mind gets scattered. Or by engagement in, in enjoyment of uh, desired objects, mind gets scattered, withdraw from there. Suprasannam lai chaiva. When the mind is here in laya, relaxed, and fallen asleep, awaken it, or asaswada. Suprasannam actually the commentator has included it as the restfulness of sleep. But it could also mean, suprasannam means gladness. So it could also mean the rasaswada, that means uh, tasting of the peace of a calm mind. And he has not mentioned the kashai here, but these are the four major obstacles. We'll leave it at this. He will tell us the solutions as we go along. And then he'll conclude the chapter. Yeah. But remember the whole big picture. Who is this meant for? Otherwise, what will happen is, we'll keep, after some time, we'll keep getting the question. Just a minute. What are we supposed to meditate on here? <laughs> if you think that, then it's much better. Ishta Devata, Mantra, Upasana, that's stage one. You all, if you already, if, you, if this is for you, you already know what you are supposed to meditate on. You have already got an intuition of that, a breakthrough with that. You need to immerse yourself in that. You need to, that word is there, marinate. So the cooking has already been done. You know what they are talking about. But you need to stay with it. So this is for that stage. Very good. Yes. Swami, the, the six uh, negative aspects. The, the six enemies. Shararipu, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, if you need an enactment for it, it will be NYC. Right? So when you say stay with it. Why NYC? That's basically all of New York City. <laughs> that in no, New York, it's, it's, it's but, the six enemies. Uh, true, but we are all here also. So the, the good guys are here. Don't it, worry. It, 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 so when you yeah. say stay Yes, that's true. That's true. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu